And now, Ned Williams talk attacking Chrome interprocess communication, reliably finding bugs to escape the Chrome sandbox. He will be talking about finding bugs in the Chrome interprocess communication in order to escape from the sandbox using a, f a farthing method to enumerate the attack surface of the Chrome interprocess communication. Uh, Ned is a vulnerability researcher. He likes C and C++ vulnerabilities, did research for consoles and browsers, and now started to work on mobile devices. Please welcome him with a huge round of applause. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, my name's Ned, and today I'll be talking about uh, Chrome IPC. Uh, and actually, as I was writing this talk, I kind of came up with this idea to make it more useful to everyone. And the way I ended up doing this was by trying to um, start really general and then kind of going more and more specific um, all the way down to the Chrome IPC fuzzing. So if you're really technical, the end will be um, still interesting. And then uh, if you're new to this stuff, hopefully the beginning part will show some of how to um, get started. So um, just a quick uh, overview about me. I've mostly been spending the last several years on uh, low-level vulnerability research. And my particular interest is on any kind of critical bugs, meaning kind of um, the more severe the individual bug, like the more interesting to me. So I'm trying to kind of solve this problem of um, you know, how do we make the bug finding process effective enough to bring out these like, really rare hidden bugs? And um, you will see an example of how to do that by the end. Um, but uh, just an overview, like, I've basically worked on four things, the first being CTFs, then uh, went to 3DS and Chrome. Now I'm starting on XNU, but just a month ago, so uh, not too much yet. Uh, before we get into it, I just wanted to give a little recap of what happened since uh, uh, last time. So. Uh, I was part of the Nintendo Hacking Talk uh, two years ago here, and I presented uh, two exploits called Sound Hacks and Fast Hacks. And um, uh, not to go into it too much, but I did want to share like um, what happened here because I was actually surprised. I put Google Analytics on the Sound Hacks website, and I thought like you know maybe a thousand people use it or something, but I just looked at the stats like. Uh, a couple weeks ago, and then turned out like 800k people used it or something. And then I searched YouTube and found like these huge videos where um, they were copied. So like, um, I wanted to have a screenshot, but it's copyrighted, so didn't do that. But uh, basically, it looks like you know something on the order of about a million users, which is crazy because this is one of my um, intro projects, really. So I think like. You know, this should show you that you don't have to be all the way up onto Chrome or whatever it is to uh, get into this and do some huge fun project. And then um, I just wanted to publicly talk about the donations because I had a donation uh, link on the Soundhacks website. And um, we fortunately received about $1,000 in donations. And then half of that went to um, the emulator people because they um, uh, that's how I eventually wrote my exploit for that uh, sound hacks. So it made sense to repay that. And then the other half went to uh, buying switches for like the toolchain developers um, who couldn't afford it. And so um, just wanted to thank everyone who used this or whoever um, donated. Uh, just shout out. Um, so we'll get into the actual meat of the talk. So basically, um, I want to focus on. Um, the bug finding process, not exploitation necessarily, because this topic is pretty well explored, I think. And I think the bug hunting aspect is kind of what's the most prohibitive for people to join in. And when I look at the number of people who I play CTF with who are really good at exploitation, um, and then a the number of like these prolific bug hunters, it just seems like, um, from what I see from how smart people are, there should be more people doing the bug hunting. And I hope that if I can talk about it, um, more people can come over. So um, with that, the agenda will be just, you know, overall, how do you make a process to achieve any goal? Then uh, next, how do you apply this kind of, some kind of strategy to bug hunting? Then 
um, this new fuzzing style I've been kind of developing. Um, some other people out in the industry have been working on. And then finally, how does this all tie back to Chrome IPC? So um, also, just to mention, I uh, should mention that uh, the bug I'll be showing in this uh, presentation was used in a full chain exploit that I developed with a couple other people. And um, the details of the exploitation of that um, will be discussed at OffensiveCon. So that's also here in Germany. And hopefully, people will check it out. So how do you become an expert at anything? And I kind of was thinking this before I even started anything. And I was like in the CTF stage. And I was just kind of curious like if I approach this with the mindset of uh, there's this arbitrary skill I want to learn. Um, and if I approach it strategically, like what's going to happen? Um, so I looked into this expert research, and then there's kind of this idea of pop psych, like you need to study something deliberately for 10,000 hours to get good at it. And you know, there's some debate about you know, this number. It's kind of made up, I guess. But the essential idea of deliberate practice, I think, is very useful. And it's exactly how I structured my, my studying. And so what deliberate means is uh, when you're learning, you want to be thinking uh, like purposefully, like I, I want to make sure that the project that I'm doing is making me get better. Um, I want to be actually thinking about um, how I'm structuring my, my training. And then um, you want to make sure that you're kind of always struggling because that's just how you're growing. Um, so essentially to do this, you just need to keep picking projects that have um, some like success and failure feedback uh, mechanism that's tied to the real world. And you know, with bug hunting, like this is very obvious. You know, you're either finding a bug or not. Um, and like as I mentioned, you want something difficult but achievable. And so this kind of order that I did the different projects I mentioned in the beginning was like specifically chosen um, so that each stage would be achievable to me, but also like really, really stretching what I could do. Um, and there's a funny anecdote. There's this guy uh, named Ben Franklin from American history. And I read the story that he used to be really bad at writing and wanted to get better. So the way he did it was he took um, an essay that looked perfect to him. And then he took notes on it. And then a week later, he rewrote the essay uh, from the notes. And then he would just compare the, the goal versus what he had done. And um, basically saw all the shortcomings. And so um, that kind of just stuck in my head. And so um, I'll show like how do you apply this kind of trick to bug finding uh, practice. Um, and then just another thing with uh, setting goals for bug hunting. Um, a lot of it is psychological. I think it's almost psychological more than uh, intelligence, like for sure. And uh, basically, you want to iteratively pick harder and harder projects so that your tolerance for failure goes up and up. And so by the time I was working on Chrome, um, I worked on it every day for six months, like right home from work until 1 AM, sleep up, and then all day every weekend, and found nothing the whole time. And then just one day, found something. And then from there, all that accumulated like struggle and effort uh, when the bug precipitated, it was just like a sign that all these like necessary skills were there, and then I was able to repeat it. And so, um, so now I'll talk about what that actually looked like for bug hunting. So, when you think about how to train the skill, I think there's kind of two constituent skills that are important, and those are um, knowing where to look and then recognizing the bug when you're looking at it, and. This first part is um, just from my own experience. It seemed like just being a developer, it's pretty easy to get a sense for you know you can look at the Git logs like I'm mentioning here. Uh, you know, are there uh, crashes happening somewhere in the library? Are bugs getting reported? You know, publicly, um, does the code look bad? You know, it's not hard to tell that something looks sketchy, but I think what's really hard is getting the bug to kind of come out, and so. Uh, that's uh, where I'll talk about strategy kind of directly. And so um, I kind of have this uh, training idea where essentially um, 
once you have this kind of target in mind where it's a little bit out of your skill range, but you think it's doable, you try to enumerate all the existing bug reports and then um, look through each of them. And then this, it's this like Ben Franklin idea. Like you take the bug and then you look at, uh, usually there'll be like, you know, this block of text and they're mentioning like the file where it's happening and stuff. And you can kind of skim it and sense like um, where the bug is. And so we know without actually looking at what it is. And so then you go over and you try to find it yourself. And, um, you know, it's really important that you actively try to look for the bug yourself and kind of strain yourself. And when you've given up, essentially, then you look at, you know, what was the bug. Um, and then through that struggle, it's usually pretty clear, like, what was the fundamental thing you were missing? Um, and, you know, just by repeating this process constantly, this is how you train. And so this is actually how I first ever started on bug hunting was, um, you know, some of you may know Yuru, he's this like uh, really talented researcher. He's been at it for a long time. And I remember seeing this blog post from him showing all these IDA Pro bugs. And it just kind of blew my mind like, wow, someone uh, took uh, IDA and found like security vulnerabilities in it. And then when I looked at the bug reports, they're pretty small. So I thought, okay, how, how do I practice and how could I have done this myself? So um, basically the first day, you know, they're all like integer overflow bugs. And I could barely even, like I knew what inter integer overflow was, but I hadn't like actively looked for it before. And so, you know, I was looking at the function and I couldn't find it. And um, basically I went to sleep feeling like, oh God, like I'll never be able to do this stuff. And then the next day I looked at it again and I was like, oh yeah, that's actually easy. And then, um, kind of filled the second one, and then kind of by the third day, I was like able to just see where they were once you know I knew where to look. So um, that kind of made me think, okay, I'll just keep doing this for a long time and keep doing harder and harder. So um, this is essentially the strategy. Like I think, uh, you know, I, I'm probably the perfect example of someone who was like an intermediate CTF player, really like um, insecure, whatever, like, and just, you know, wanted to get into this, but I had no idea what I was doing. And I just kept thinking if I just believe in this kind of process, you know, hopefully it works out. And um, so here's just like a little really basic roadmap if you want to try to replicate what I did, which is um, to focus on CTF, because if you can do uh, CTF binary problems, um, these are perfect examples of a kind of training where you try to do something yourself, there's a write-up, and like w once you can do these problems, you know all the kind of low-level details that are needed. You know, you know what a bug is, things like that. Um, and then from there, you just kind of progressively do harder and harder targets. And so um, there's kind of this component where, like, you know, I don't. You can't really assess your own ability, like how much of this is innate or something. And um, it just seemed to me that, uh, regardless of that, you know, this. Like I'm saying here, you know, this isn't chess where you have people like trained from birth with like perfect study and like decades of, you know, like we're barely figuring this stuff out and it's just kind of a huge mess. And so there's plenty of room for new people to join in. Um, and then also like there's a lot of these kind of stories about people who are just insanely naturally gifted and stuff. And I tried really hard to like look into what these people are actually doing, and I haven't found a case where um, someone wasn't working extremely hard. And so, uh, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, so just for the sake of time, I won't go into this too much, but if you're looking at the slides later, I just kind of give more detail on, like, how I picked the mini projects and got down to Chrome. Um, so uh, now let's talk about uh, fuzzing. And so before I get into it, I, I should emphasize that you should really know how to do auditing. And the first couple of years, and like, not until into that six months of failure on Chrome, um, you know, I was doing auditing the whole time. And uh, I think fuzzing gets a bad rap because people think that these are unrelated strategies and people are only a fuzzer person or an auditor person. And um, really, I think these things are extremely, um, like they work really well together, but you can't really know why fuzzing is failing or how to even apply it or where to apply it without um, being able to audit yourself. And um, 
part of this was like I noticed on Chrome that I could audit things, but there, essentially the bug density was so low on the sandbox attack surface that I needed a way to kind of automate what I was looking for uh, in each each subsystem I was looking at. So um, you know, you, you have like 20 subsystems that you want to um, read. Well, you know, it takes about a week each minimum to learn. Um, it's a lot faster to try to fuzz for like a day or two each thing, and then um, I don't know. Like it, it's I, I can't explain it. I just did random things, and then this is what worked. So, um, so how would you practice fuzzing? It's it really the same idea that I had about auditing, where you take a bug and um, just ask yourself like, how would I have written a fuzzer in the first place to write to, to hit the bug? Um, how could um, how could I have known to write the fuzzer that would have triggered this? Um, you know, am I lacking something in auditing ability? Am I not able to write fuzzers well enough? And it actually took me probably like a year of of fuzzer writing to get good enough where I could actually act on my ideas. Like, just it's it's kind of uh, tricky, and so. Um, We'll get back to it later, but this exact uh, idea of practicing fuzzing on something that looks unfuzzable is how I found this um, real exploitable sandbox escape. Um, so really quick, uh, just for those of you who don't know too much about fuzzing, uh, at least in like the current meta, uh, essentially there's this tool that, called AFL that came out in 2014, which um, I think really shifted uh, how well fuzzing worked. and. The idea is essentially that you have some corpus of inputs that you want to fuzz, and then as you're mutating them, um, you're looking for coverage feedback, which is um, compiled into your code. And then as you're mutating and uh, running new test cases, when you find new coverage, you uh, take that input and put in your corpus. And uh, over time, your corpus kind of grows and grows as more coverage is uh, hit. And so there's uh, this just seems to work really well. And then there's uh, another version of this basically called libfuzzer and this is just written by the uh, LVM project and uh, the same people who wrote address sanitizer also wrote libfuzzer and just in my experience it's written in a way that's a lot more extensible and like easy to understand and play with and so it makes it uh, kind of easier to like, audit and fuzz together and so uh, you know, if you want to think about uh, what fuzzing is, essentially you're trying to um, replicate the normal testing process, but um, kind of parameterizing uh, like what a unit test would be doing with some input bytes that uh, you're just feeding into something and seeing if it crashes. And so what's interesting is there's kind of this gap in the middle of like an end-to-end -end test, which AFL will give you, just feed a binary, or like the unit test, which libfuzzer will give you, where you just keep f stuffing bytes into a parser. And um, real security vulnerabilities are kind of logical in nature. And I think that's why people think that fuzzing isn't applicable. And um, I think there's actually kind of this uh, part in the middle where if you see a few components that look suspicious, and then um, you can integrate them and fuzz them in isolation, but um, have the complexity that you'd kind of see in a real program, um, that's where a lot of bugs come out. And so um, uh, how we do this is using uh, grammar. And so essentially it's combining generative fuzzing uh, with coverage guided fuzzing. And so um, we'll touch on how that works uh, in a minute. But just for some more evidence on you know why does this work well, like I'm not the only person who uh, is doing this kind of Simultaneously, uh, myself and uh, two, two other people, I guess, uh, seemed to have stumbled across this idea last year or two years ago. And um, those are uh, SysCaller and LokiHard. So SysCaller is a kind of fully automated uh, Linux kernel fuzzer. And if you guys haven't seen this, it's uh, kind of hilarious. Like, essentially, they are automatically generating zero-day bugs like uh, tens per month at least and they automatically generate the test case like submit the report when the commit comes in it's like automatically tracked it's basically this zero day generator sitting there and yeah no and, and I see this I'm like okay there's 3,000 bugs that are being found um, 
there's a web app for it and you can just download it, you know. And uh, I saw the Linux talk from the author of Syscaller and the YouTube video has like 100 views and stuff. I'm just like, okay. So people need to, and I gotta reiterate how important this stuff is. Um, so then there's Loki Hart as well, who's like a famous, extremely talented, um, uh, kind of canonical auditing fuzzer person. And uh, he seems to be doing a very similar thing with uh, Chakra and, and V8, and he's finding like tens of interesting exploitable bugs. Um, and then there's me who applied this on the Chrome Sandbox and uh, found over 30 bugs, about half of which are security relevant, and then five of which were like uh, sandbox escape without render code execution. So, um, you know, this is just to emphasize, like, we're finding really important things with this uh, technique. And uh, since I discussed this the first time a couple of months ago at POC conference, um, it's uh, been used by someone in the Chrome security team to fuzz SQLite, and they're already finding new bugs, like, in the first week. Um, so just more of the evidence, like here's the kind of the breakdown of um, some of the bugs I found with this strategy. Uh, so uh, just to highlight a couple of them, uh, or maybe three of them. So the first one was like an out of bounds read, uh, just an integer overflow in blobs. And this lets you, uh, you can make a blob and then um, ask to read part of it. And then the offset could have been negative and there's just an integer overflow. They got the check wrong, so it was a full like memory disclosure from the browser process. Um, there's also this uh, like app cache use after free, which is what I used in the exploit this year. And then finally, uh, I guess the, the critical bugs are pretty interesting, so uh, two of these. I guess the first pair are in quick, and uh, the first one is a stack buffer overflow with just a bad packet that comes in over the network. So you just browse to an attacker uh, uh, site, and they stack buffer overflow Chrome browser process, which is outside the sandbox. And it jumped over the, the uh, stack cookie. So uh, that was bad. And then, <laughs> then uh, the, these block file cache problems, these were um, in the HTTP caching mechanism, which is also um, in the privileged process. And, um, these were actually crashing in the wild for three years, and uh, the, they didn't know how to, I guess, I, I don't know if they didn't have resources or they didn't know how to address the problem or something, but I sent them the test case, and then they closed like four bug reports, you know, ancient bugs. So, you know, it just goes to show that uh, this kind of technique works in a variety of really interesting places that are really important. And so, um, now let's get to the boring stuff. So uh, what's protobuf? Well, protobuf is uh, this data serialization format uh, from Google. And it doesn't really matter that it's protobuf. Just this idea is uh, you want some kind of, um, you want to encode like a little language for yourself uh, that expresses uh, what you want to fuzz at kind of a higher abstraction layer than just fuzzing bytes randomly. And so if any of you have done functional programming, like uh, I had been doing stuff with OCaml and like uh, quick check for a couple of years. And then when I saw this, it was just immediately recognized the pattern. Um, essentially what you can do is you can create this little tree structure of just basic types like enum. Um, you create these uh, messages and like, you can just kind of specify um, actions you want your fuzzer to take. And then um, what, uh, this next tool, uh, libprotobuf mutator will do is it will take the specification you've written and link it into libfuzzer so that it will automatically fuzz and create these like trees that are, um, you know, these kind of random ASTs from this little language you wrote. And then you can kind of parse this language, which sounds crazy or more hard than it is, but you essentially, um, you can generate this highly structured input, which makes it a lot easier to explore uh, like a logical type of uh, bugs. So um, yeah, just really want to emphasize that you know, this strategy can be used to fuzz anything. And so um, kind of this same exact idea is being used to find bugs in like caching APIs, encrypted networking protocols, uh, kernels, sandbox, uh, like serialization code, um, 
stateful systems that have IPC and network interaction and timing uh, as part of it, which is what we'll show at the end. Um, and so, like, what's what's common here? You know, we just fuzz all of these different systems in the same way. Uh, the idea is, like, as an auditor, what what you do is you kind of notice, like, okay, there's some subsystem, like uh, some caching mechanism with a simple API, and you uh, look at how it's implemented. And it looks complicated, so you think, okay, you know, if I can write a fuzzer in like a few hours for this, you know, it seems like high value. So. Um, once you kind of play with the API a bit and understand like uh, how the API works, you know you can just write this little specification for the API in Protobuf and go ahead and write the fuzzer. So uh, uh, basically, uh, I'll show how this works on Chrome. So um, just to make sure I cover all of uh, kind of the background knowledge, you know, for those of you that don't really care about fuzzing or don't care about anything else, you know, at least you can get bootstrapped on. Uh, Chrome IPC research. Um, the basic idea of, of how uh, the Chrome sandboxing situation works is when I'm saying I'm finding bugs in the sandbox, like um, it's really finding bugs in the browser process which are reachable um, you know, from a sandbox process. And so um, the sandbox itself you know, is just constraining these um, render like tab processes um, so they can't really uh, do much. And then what you want to do is kind of um, jump from there to the browser process, which can do anything. So this is a very common model. Like almost, you know, like on 3DS, you know, you have like userland, kernel, then security code processor. You have on Linux, like you might have a userland process. And then in the sandbox, there's some APIs in the kernel you can hit, like syscalls you can hit. And basically everything just keeps boiling down to there's some API that you can look at from the less privileged context. And then if you can trigger a bug in that API, you escape, and then you just kind of, you know, this kind of applies everywhere. And so this idea of understanding, like, uh, self-contained chunks of, like, uh, you know, the syscalls in Linux are like, hundreds, but being able to look at and say, like, okay, here are 10 related syscalls. Um, you know, this is like a subsystem that I want to fuzz in isolation. Like, this is kind of uh, how you want to think about it. And so um, if you just want to get started on uh, Chrome, uh, you, what you want to do is look at, OK, what are these endpoints in the browser process that I can reach from the render? And then um, you don't really have to understand how IPC works to do this. You just have to be able to recognize where, um, what you're allowed to hit from the render to the browser and um, what's actually in the browser. And so. Fortunately, the, the Chrome code base is pretty well organized, so they just tell you. If you just generally go into any folder that says browser in it, like all of this is outside the sandbox and uh, prone to sandbox escape. And so uh, most of my bugs I found were in this uh, content browser subsystem kind of thing. Um, but you can look anywhere. And I think like um, all these results I've had the last year were just like in one folder. And so um, you know, there's so many other places where bugs can manifest that I didn't even look at. So uh, basically, there's plenty of room for more. Um, so just to go in on what I did is uh, in this kind of content uh, stuff is uh, you just want to see where kind of the uh, APIs that are reachable from the render are, are enumerated. And those are in uh, this render process host impl init function. Uh, so yeah, like C++ is kind of wordy, but you, know, you get used to it. Uh, basically, there's, there's two places where the, the APIs are set up and, uh, or the interfaces are exposed. Uh, those are uh, create message filters and register mojo interfaces. And it took me a while to realize where these were, like a year or something. But <laughs> like that's, those are the key uh, functions to look at. And so um, I'll skip over old style IPC because it's going away, but it's pretty uh, easy to figure out what's going on if you look at it. Um, so I'll talk a bit about Mojo. So um, essentially, this is a new IPC um, kind of platform that the Chrome team has developed. And um, the idea is they want to, uh, I guess, simplify this process for developers in terms of defining a, 
um, interface that you want to expose to a render or some other client somewhere else. And um, essentially, you write these little interface files called .mojom, and then um, the build system will generate all this C++ glue for you that you can just like subclass something, and then um, it handles all the, the mechanics of actually exposing this um, to other processes and, and so on. And so as a security researcher, you know, you don't really care about that. All you care about is, like, what can I reach and uh, how do I know, like, what to fuzz or something? So uh, what I guess I looked at is just, you know, what are some of the Mojom files that have, um, that are subclassed in this content slash browser? And you can just do a little grep to check this. Uh, so um, essentially, the app cache was one of the bugs I found this year. and. Um, here's the API that the renderer can, um, you know, these are all the messages that the renderer can send to the browser, and along with the types of uh, the arguments. And so, you know, that's pretty straightforward. Um, so in the browser process, this is the code that we're trying to attack, which is the actual C++ uh, like implementation code for this API. And so you can see their subclassing there, and then they just, make sure to override all these virtual uh, functions uh, that actually implements the API. And so um, I won't go too into detail on this part because it's a little boring, but essentially, um, you know, how does a renderer get from it to all the way over to this kind of browser C++ code? Well, it essentially goes through this like request mechanism where the renderer tells the browser process, like, hey, I have this kind of request uh, to access this interface, and then um, it'll actually just uh, create that uh, like dispatcher host implementation object, and um, you know just feed in that request over there. So essentially, stuff gets glued together somehow, and um, you know then there's uh, this stuff, which is kind of ugly. But I mean, here's where. Um, you're actually exposing the ability to to do this. So here's here's where we're actually like the request comes in, and then where um, this kind of request handler function gets fed in is that thing I mentioned earlier, the register Mojo interfaces. So it's pretty it's named pretty well. It's kind of easy to follow, um, and they're adding new stuff constantly. All of this stuff is on the attack surface. Like I think, um, and I stopped Chrome a couple of months ago. I think I looked, and there's like you know five new APIs in there or something. Like they're just constantly adding things. So um, just a quick point about this. Uh, essentially, you want to do fuzzing in process with this like libfuzzer protobuf mutator uh, strategy. And um, you don't want to be like actually doing IPC and like it's just very brittle and, and weird. So uh, what you really want to do is just like here's the C++ object. I want to just instantiate it and call those functions uh, myself. And then um, this whole thing is just very lightweight and, and easy to uh, play with, which is um, you know, having a lightweight and like very easy to rebuild, tweak something, and play with it, print things. Like kind of the faster you can iterate, the better. So all, anything that's too complicated, like the success rate goes way down. So um, uh, essentially, like, uh, you know, the uh, the fuzzer that I made open source is like the way you should do it, but the way I actually did it was I just um, like made the object, uh, like commented out the, the private, like, I don't know if you can see it on here. Yeah, so just like commented out private, created the object, started calling these things randomly, it would crash and I would just hand fix things and, you know, it's kind of sloppy, but, uh, you know, you're, you're testing something in a very small unit that's not really exposed to that kind of testing. So um, now let's, kind of put together everything I've talked about so far. Um, so this exploitable app cache used after free I found this year was found using this same idea of deliberate practice. So um, I looked at uh, this app cache subsystem in the browser process, and I noticed that there were three old bug reports uh, that were triggering memory corruption. and they were pretty interesting because they involved different uh, kind of ways of attacking. And these things had clearly been um, audited. And I had actually seen these bugs a couple of years ago. And um, 
I, I kind of used it as evidence to myself at the time that fuzzing doesn't work and you need auditing. But um, it kind of stuck in my head and I kept thinking someday I'll come back to this and uh, um, like I'll, I'll overcome it, you know? And so <laughs> essentially uh, what's interesting is, you know, I've already talked about, you know, it's easy to specify the API and just feed uh, IPC messages into it. And I think you know, everyone kind of understands that who does any IPC fuzzing. But then there's also this idea that you've got some remote server that the app cache thing like creates a network request, some server is uh, you know, serving that request and doing different things. And so in the second bug, it actually matters when things were, like when the server was returning data um, because some jobs like stay alive and then if you send an IPC message to, you know, close your session and then the job is still alive, there's like a raw pointer somewhere and you know, something going on that it matters that the, the server uh, keeps the connection open. And then the last thing is just kind of a logical issue in if the server uh, returns these HTTP codes in the headers of the response in this kind of weird order, you trigger some logical bug that actually leads to memory corruption. And so, um, you know, I looked at this and I said, okay, well, so what do we need to test to cover all this? Uh, basically, IPC network and um, that timing. And so uh, not only that, but this is kind of a stateful thing. So we want to make sure that um, for each fuzzing session that um, we kind of reset the state completely. And fortunately, in C++, this isn't too hard because, um, you know, you just destroy the object and if it doesn't exist anymore what state is there. So, you know, you just make sure that, like, you don't leave things lingering. Um, so, yeah, so I just had this basic idea. We'll call random IPCs with this fuzzed input. Uh, we return uh, random data from the network, and then uh, we reset the state of the cache on every iteration. And then part of it was thinking, okay, like, if I can repro these old bugs, if I reintroduce them by editing the source, um, this is kind of appealing to this like deliberate practice idea that like I could have written a fuzzer that would trigger these old things, and this is kind of the idea I was pursuing when I actually triggered a, a new bug. So um, now, what's tricky about this is if you just return random data from the network, you're not going to make much progress, and this is kind of where the auditing background comes in. Is uh, you know you want to think about what is expressive enough of, uh, like how do I make my fuzzer expressive enough that I hit, uh, can hit everything, but then not so generic that it's just spraying, like it's just noise. And so um, I'll show how I did that uh, in this specification. And so at a high level, my kind of root node in the AST or the tree of uh, uh, the fuzzer message is this uh, session message. And then this just contains a sequence of commands. And so commands are something I also made up. And so the first 10 of them are all the different IPC calls I can do. Um, the 11th one is um, handling any pending requests or pre-caching uh, like a response to any new request that comes in. Um, so that handles like both the asynchronous case where it makes a request and it's waiting for the server and also like the synchronous version where the response comes immediately. And then lastly, this run until idle thing, which um, essentially just, uh, it helps you, like if you kind of place these uh, run until idles uh, randomly as you're, as you're kind of doing these IPC messages, um, you're kind of flushing the queue of accumulated uh, work. And so what this lets you do is kind of identify these race condition uh, type things. Uh, because uh, you can do something like uh, do a bunch of IPCs that come in and are handled at the same time without like actually serving, like actually doing the work yet. And then you do this run until idle and then like all the work happens. Um, and, you know, I didn't like think of this a priori in some like smart way. I, I just looked at like the unit tests and I just tried to think about like, okay, how are these developers already testing it? And this is just what it looked like they were doing. So, um, these messages are very easy to write. Essentially, just provide um, for each IPC message uh, that I could have sent to this thing. Uh, just make sure all the arguments are, are correct. And then um, 
there's a little bit of cleverness, which is like the host ID is um, also breaks down to uh, just an enum of like uh, zero, one, two, because just from looking at the code, you know that if I'm randomly um, creating hosts, destroying them and stuff over the whole like, you know, four billion int 32 uh, IDs, like it's just going to fall apart and not find anything interesting. So, um, you know, I just constrained that. For the URL, I also that is also a custom message that I constrained to just return a few like pre-made legit URLs, so that way I'm also not testing like the URL parsing stuff. Um, so then, you know, how do I handle the network? Well, I just read the source and looked at what are all the types of uh, HTTP response codes that affect control flow, and I just enumerated them, and then. Um, for any given uh, request that comes in from the app cache system, uh, I kind of just encode anything interesting about the response that I thought of just by um, by reviewing the source. And it seemed like the things that mattered were those HTTP codes, um, whether or not the headers asked app cache to do caching or just download it once. Uh, and then also, the, the app cache uh, can request from the server this manifest file, which has some metadata about um, what files that it should be caching. And so, um, you know, essentially just all of this is encoded in, in one message. And so, how you go from this like high level description to actually fuzzing um, is just this. So, you can see how, how simple it is. You're really just. Um, you know, I looked at kind of the unit test code and saw how they set up this app cache service. And so um, they let you pass in this URL loader factory. And uh, what this is is just this kind of uh, unit testable uh, network um, request thing. So this is how I'm, I'm like, you know, intercepting the network requests and feeding data. And so I do this little setup. And then here I just create the one like renderer to browser host. Um, this is just kind of simulating how you would do the, the Mojo stuff if uh, it was a, sorry, a real, uh, the, the real renderer to browser interaction. And then I just go through those commands that I mentioned and just do these things. So I mean, this is all it is. You just pull the host ID out of this uh, protobuf message um, that we're getting at the top there, that session that I um, defined as like the top level tree node. and. Uh, you know, you just go through and you just call the the uh, APIs that are there. And so, um, how to get the network stuff to work? You know, as I mentioned, I have this like mock URL loader uh, factory, also C++ y but <laughs> essentially, um, it's this. Uh, well, okay, so this is when I basically handle one of my request messages that I came up with. Um, I just simulate a response. This is a built-in like unit test function that they have in their code base. And I just uh, pass in the relevant uh, bits that came from that message. So um, yeah, so this is what it looks like. I have some kind of do request uh, helper function. And then I just pass my stuff through to it. Um, and so it takes that like URL factory and then serves responses to anything that's waiting. And then um, what's interesting here and what's necessary to find the bug is that, um, you know, I mentioned that this is asynchronous. So what will happen is when you do like register host, uh, and then if I go back, to, yeah, you like register host, select a cache, um, do some things, like, like the app cache will make a request to the server and then um, get this manifest and then it will start making requests to download things and then um, these things are like pending, uh, it's pending like uh, responses that it's waiting for from the server. And so um, it actually mattered that um, you mutate the state further before those responses come in. And so by doing this like in between the IPC messages, um, not like preloading the, the network factory with a bunch of responses, I'm actually like um, serving things like I'm not making, I'm not encoding an assumption about when I'm serving responses. And I know this is kind of tedious to, to go so into detail, but um, essentially, uh, you know, you run this thing, it's a maybe 
150 lines or something and then uh, trigger this bug with address sanitizer. And so um, uh, essentially a use after free happens and uh, what, what's going on here is you can see the scoped ref pointer destructor and it turns out that um, when, let's see here, yeah, so when you go to unregister the host, like uh, it's an IPC, that's an IPC message there at the bottom that I, that I sent. And then it just accidentally, um, this is kind of inaccurate, this uh, stack trace, but essentially um, some ref count goes from one to zero and then it starts destroying this app cache object. And then um, in the destructor, one of these kind of uh, requests was waiting on a response from the server and then it uh, essentially um, like gives a reference back to that other object. And that's kind of uh, aligning some details, but essentially like the ref count went back up to one and then now you're adding a bunch of references uh, all over the place to something while it's being destroyed. And so um, what happens is now you have all these pointers to a freed object and then you can trigger uh, access to that freed thing again later. And so this is kind of the recipe for an exploitable bug. And so uh, I just wanted to point out that all of this fuzzer is open source and it's just in the Chrome code base. So if you download it or go online to the code search tool, you can just search for app cache fuzzer and, and it will come up. Um, so then uh, real quickly, just to kind of cover the, the uh, exploitation, you know, I guess I, I have more time than I thought, so I, I compressed this a lot. But essentially, um, I did this in part in a, in a chain with two other guys, uh, Salo and Nicholas. And so Salo provided the RCE bug. And so from there, um, we get code execution in the renderer. And then this lets us send arbitrary IPC messages. And so um, it's kind of annoying to send IPC with Mojo uh, like arbitrarily. So we kind of piggybacked on um, the renderer side, like glue code for sending these app cache messages. So we just like found the C++ object and called into it. And then um, all in all, we end up with this primitive where we can uh, deck ref and like release uh, reference to this ref counted thing um, like after it's been freed uh, multiple times. So uh, there's two stages to exploiting this. Like because we're in the renderer and we only have one bug, we need to turn this into a, a memory disclosure. And so, uh, you know, fortunately this bug can be triggered repeatedly. And so the idea here is um, Triggering it once gives you this, you know, decrement by n primitive, and so um, when you're releasing, you know, if you ever hit zero, you'll trigger the, the destructor again, and so um, essentially what you want to do for the leak is to not trigger the destructor because it will blow up, uh, but rather find a string somewhere in memory where there's a, you know, string pointing to the heap, and then decrement the string pointer, so then it starts like sliding somewhere else into the heap so that when you read that string back, you're actually um, leaking heap data. And so um, we did that. So you know, there's some object that had a standard C++ string in the beginning. On Windows, the first uh, keyword is like the, uh, the pointer to the string data. So we decrement this. Uh, it, was, it was actually a cookie object, so we just read the cookie back from the browser. And then in the cookie value, we see the, the leaked uh, bytes. And then from there, there was a, uh, a V table, um, V table access that we can control um, in the destructor. So we make another fake object that looks like it has one reference left. You know, make it hit zero, so destructor is triggered, and then this app cache uh, thing gets confused and essentially calls a controlled V table pointer. And then from there, you know, those are the primitives you need to write an exploit. And then it was just a matter of kind of uh, putting it together and. Um, if you're curious about that, again, you should uh, look forward to Nicholas's talk. And so just a summary, uh, essentially, starting all the way from the beginning, you want to be practicing deliberately, um, keep working constantly and keep identifying gaps and actively working to, to improve. You know, which it sounds weird, but 
you kind of want to keep that in mind. And uh, use this new technique with libfuzzer and protobuf mutator. I can promise you it's not going to be uh, the last time you see someone using this. And uh, I mentioned I've started on XNU, and uh, we'll see some initial results pretty soon on that. Uh, it's working. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and lastly, uh, never give up. Just it may take months, but it's fine. So uh, with that, uh, I guess I'll open to questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that talk. Sure. Yeah. If you do have a question, please line up at the microphones in the room and try to limit your question to one single sentence. If you would like to leave at this point, please do that as quietly as possible so that everyone else can still stay for the questions. And also, if you're listening on the stream, you can ask a question online to this. Seems there is no question. Ah, one. there yeah. is one. Microphone number two, your question, please. Hello. Hello. Um, I just want to ask, uh, why have you chosen uh, Chrome for bug hunting? Was it just like you picked one random browser and then started? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's uh, basically uh, just kind of the hardest thing I could think of that I could plausibly do, you know, just for the purpose of getting better. And so um, there's more to it. Like, I think Chrome, the way it's written, is very amenable to research. And like, I actually didn't know C++ before I worked on Chrome. So like learning, looking at a great example of a C++ code base and learning from that um, was really helpful to me. And you know, I glossed over kind of my, my path, but I was actually finding random, like obscure, like library bugs that weren't even reachable at first. So, just the quality of Chrome makes it so that what you're training is the real talent, not just like being able to decipher bad code. So, yeah, highly recommended. I, I I can say that like, I definitely feel that the two years I invested on that one project like completely helped me get better. So, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Single angel question from the internet. Hello. Uh, there is one question from the internet. The question is, is it possible to attack from IPC via hardware vulnerabilities like Meltdown or Spectre? Uh, is it, so the question is, is it, I guess, possible to attack using Meltdown or Spectre? So um, I don't know. I guess it's possible. I was essentially focusing only on kind of application level bugs, so things that I could trigger like, kind of deterministically um, using only bugs in the Chrome code itself. And so, I mean, also th those things came along like way after I was doing my research. So, uh, you know, I can't comment on that, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure someone knows. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I see no more people on the microphones or questions on the internet. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for your talk and thanks for being yeah. here. Thank you.